Demosthenes, a politician who stood opposed to the military ambitions of Philip of Macedonia, who had taken Greece by force of arms, attacks his arch-rival Eschines, leader of the pro-Philip faction, in this speech delivered in 330 BC. In what was a political trial against Demosthenes, Eschines had attacked his enemy. Demosthenes replies in withering tones. Eschines was exiled, and Demosthenes was awarded a crown of gold in his honor. Of what a statesman may be responsible for, I allow the utmost scrutiny. I deprecate it not. What are his functions? To observe things in the beginning, to foresee and foretell them to others, this I have done. Again, wherever he finds delays, backwardness, ignorance, jealousies, vices inherent and unavoidable in all communities, to contract them into the narrowest compass, and on the other hand, to promote unanimity and friendship and zeal in the discharge of duty. All this, too, I have performed, and no one can discover the least neglect on my part. Ask any man by what means Philip achieved most of his successes, and you will be told by his army and by his bribing and corrupting men in power. Well, your forces were not under my command or control, so that I cannot be questioned for anything done in that department. But by refusing the price of corruption, I have overcome Philip. For as the offer of a bribe, if it be accepted, has vanquished the taker, so the person who refuses it and is not corrupted has vanquished the person offering. Therefore is the Commonwealth undefeated as far as I am concerned. For my part, I regard anyone who reproaches his fellow man with fortune as devoid of sense. He that is best satisfied with his condition, he that deems his fortune excellent, cannot be sure that it will remain so until the evening. How then can it be right to bring it forward or upbraid another man with it? As Eschines, however, has on this subject, besides many others, expressed himself with insolence, look, men of Athens, and observe how much more truth and humanity there shall be in my discourse upon fortune than in his. The fortune of all mankind which now prevails I consider cruel and dreadful. For what Greek, what barbarian, has not in these times experienced a multitude of evils? that Athens chose the noblest policy, that she fares better than those very Greeks who thought if they abandoned us, they should abide in prosperity, I reckon as part of her good fortune. If she suffered reverses, if all happened not to us as we desired, I conceive she has had that share of the general fortune which fell to our lot. As to my fortune, personally speaking, or that of any individual among us, it should, as I conceive, be judged of in connection with personal matters. Such is my opinion upon the subject of fortune, a right and just one, as it appears to me, and I think you will agree with it. Eskini says that my individual fortune is paramount to that of the commonwealth, the small and mean to the good and great, how can this possibly be? However, if you are determined, Eskines, to scrutinize my fortune, compare it with your own, and if you find my fortune better than yours, cease to revile it. Look then from the very beginning, and I pray and entreat that I may not be condemned for bad taste. I don't think any person wise who insults poverty or who prides himself on having been bred in affluence. But by the slander and malice of this cruel man, I am forced into such a discussion which I will conduct with all the moderation which circumstances allow. 
I had the advantage, he skinnies, in my boyhood of going to proper school and having such allowance as a boy should have who is to do nothing mean from indigence. Arrived at man's estate, I lived suitably to my breeding. Was choir master, ship commander, rate payer. Backward in no acts of liberality, public or private, but making myself useful to the Commonwealth and to my friends. When I entered upon state affairs, I chose such a line of politics that both by my country and by many people of Greece, I have been crowned many times, and not even you, my enemies, venture to say that the line I chose was not honourable. Such, then, has been the fortune of my life. I could enlarge upon it, but I forbear, lest what I pride myself in should give offence. Contrast now the circumstances of your life and mine, gently and with temper, Eskenes, and then ask these people whose fortune they would each of them prefer. You taught reading, I went to school. You performed initiations, I received them. You danced in the chorus, I furnished it. You were assembly clerk, I was a speaker. You acted third parts, I heard you. You broke down and I hissed. You have worked as a statesman for the enemy, I for my country. I pass by the rest. But this very day, I am on my probation for a crown, and am acknowledged to be innocent of all offence, while you are already judged to be a petty hogger. And the question is whether you shall continue that trade or at once be silenced by not getting a fifth part of the votes. A happy fortune do you see you have enjoyed that you should denounce mine as miserable. You undertook this cause to exhibit your eloquence and strength of lungs, not to obtain satisfaction for any wrong. But it is not the language of an orator, Eskines, that has any value, nor yet the tone of his voice, but his adopting the same views with the people and his hating and loving the same persons that his country does. He that is thus minded will say everything with loyal intention. He that courts persons from whom the commonwealth apprehends danger to herself rides not on the same anchorage with the people and therefore has not the same expectation of safety. But, do you see, I have. For my objects are the same with those of my countrymen. I have no interest separate or distinct. Is that so with you? How can it be? when immediately after the battle you went as ambassador to Philip, who was at that period the author of your country's calamities, notwithstanding that you had before persisted in refusing that office, as all men know. And who is it that deceives the state? Surely the man who speaks not what he thinks. On whom does the crier pronounce a curse? Surely on such a man. What greater crime can an orator be charged with than that his opinions and his language are not the same? Such is found to be your character. And yet, you open your mouth and dare to look these men in the faces? Do you think they don't know you? Or are sunk in such slumber and oblivion as not to remember the speeches which you delivered in the assembly? cursing and swearing that you had had nothing to do with Philip and that I brought that charge against you out of personal enmity without foundation. No sooner came the news of the battle than you forgot all that. You acknowledged and avowed that between Philip and yourself there subsisted a relation of hospitality and friendship. New names these for your contract of hire. For upon what plea of equality or justice could Eskenes, son of Glaucothia the timbrel player, be the friend or acquaintance of Philip? I cannot see. No. You were hired to ruin the interests of your countrymen. And yet, though you have been caught yourself in open treason and informed against yourself after the fact, you revile and reproach me for things which you will find any man is chargeable with sooner than I. 
There is indeed a retirement just and beneficial to the state, such as you, the bulk of my countrymen, innocently enjoy. That, however, is not the retirement of Eskenes. Ah, from it. Withdrawing himself from public life when he pleases, and that is often, he watches for the moment when you are tired of a constant speaker, or when some reverse of fortune has befallen you, or anything untoward has happened, and many are the casualties of human life. At such a crisis, he springs up an orator, rising from his retreat like a wind, in full voice, with words and phrases collected, he rolls them out audibly and breathlessly to no advantage or good purpose whatsoever, but to the detriment of some or other of his fellow citizens and to the general disgrace. Yet from this labour and diligence, Eskenes, if it proceeded from an honest heart, Solicitous for your country's welfare, the fruit should have been rich and noble and profitable to all. Alliances of state, supplies of money, conveniences of commerce, enactment of useful laws, opposition to our declared enemies. All such things were looked for in former times, and many opportunities did the past afford for a good man and true to show himself. During which time... You are nowhere to be found, neither first, second, third, fourth, fifth, nor sixth, not in any rank at all, certainly on no service by which your country was exalted. For what alliance has come to the state by your procurement? What suckers, what acquisition of goodwill or credit? What embassy or agency is there of yours by which the reputation of the country has been increased? What concern, domestic, Hellenic, or foreign, of which you have had the management, has improved under it? What galleys, what ammunition, what arsenals, what repair of walls, what cavalry, what in the world are you good for? Two things, men of Athens, are characteristic of a well-disposed citizen. So may I speak of myself and give the least offence. In authority... His constant aim should be the dignity and preeminence of the Commonwealth. In all times and circumstances, his spirit should be loyal. I do not walk about the marketplace gay and cheerful because the stranger has prospered, holding out my right hand and congratulating those who I think will report it yonder and on any news of our own success, shudder and groan and stoop to the earth like these impious men who rail at Athens, as if in so doing they did not rail at themselves, who look abroad, and if a foreigner thrives by the distresses of Greece, are thankful for it, and say we should keep him so thriving to all time. Never, O oh ye gods, may those wishes be confirmed by you. If possible, inspire even in these men a better sense and feeling. But if they are indeed incurable, destroy them by themselves. Exterminate them on land and sea. And for the rest of us, grant that we may speedily be released from our present fears and enjoy a lasting deliverance. <laughs>